Well, I'm excited to tell you this morning, church family, that we're going to begin a brand new five-part series together called Beyond the Boundaries, Living as a Church on Mission. Now, give me a moment just to sort of set this series up. All right. Here at Christ Community Church, we would consider ourselves a values-driven church. And in recent years, the elders have worked together to try and boil down a series of six values that we believe really uh, define and sort of emphasize what our church is really all about. Uh, you'll see it here up on the screens. And you may have noticed these values on posters all around campus, and perhaps you've seen them up on the website. And here they are. We want to be a church that is, on the one hand, centered on the gospel. We want to be a church that is submitted to scripture, invested in community, living on mission, devoted to the family, committed to unity. Six values. Now, this isn't all that we value as a church, okay? But these are six values that we believe really help define our uniqueness as a church. Now, you'll remember that last year we actually focused in on one of these values as a church and sort of thought about and lived into that value as we went along. And that was the value of being devoted to the family. Do you remember that we did a preaching series on, on family values? We had lots of different programming options designed to help reinforce your marriage and your families. We even took a family-to-family -family missions trip to Mexico. Man, that was awesome. It was an incredible year just to sit in that value. Well, this year, we've just been prayerfully kind of stepping back and looking at where our church is at. And we've concluded that God wants, to sit in another, wants us to sit in another one of these values, and that is to live on mission as a church. Living on mission as a church. Now, maybe you say, well, what does that even mean to, to, to live on mission? Let's just zoom in on this value for uh, just a moment and try to get our minds around it. Living on mission, I would suggest to you, means that we're joining God in his mission to reach the lost through the saving work of his son, Jesus Christ. And we do this by sharing and showing the gospel in our everyday lives. Now, this definition has a lot of uh, aspects to it, but just let me unpack a few things. You'll notice that we're assuming that it's really God who is on mission to reach the lost through his son and through his gospel. And as you read the Bible from cover to cover, that's what you discover. God is on the mission to reach the lost. But one exciting dynamic of being a Christian believer is that we actually get to join God in what he is doing to reach a people for himself. And we do this, I believe, by both sharing and showing the gospel in our everyday lives. On the one hand, we want to share the message, the good news of Jesus, and call people to repentance and faith. On the other hand, we want to show or demonstrate the gospel's power and how we love people and how we uh, show mercy to them and kindness. And, and, and as we engage in good deeds out in society, we essentially adorn the message that we proclaim. So... With all of that in mind, living on mission, therefore, means adopting a missionary posture in your everyday life where you eagerly look for opportunities both to share and show the gospel. Come on, people. Are you excited to live on mission this year? There we go. We want to emphasize this theme in a number of ways as a church. We'll roll those out as we go along. But we wanted to start out sort of the academic year, if you will, with this series, Beyond the Boundaries, Living as a Church on Mission. And this morning's message is entitled, Crossing Personal Boundaries for Jesus. I want to start this discussion by looking at our personal lives and having us all ask ourselves, what boundaries surround me that I need to break through in order to get the gospel to people that God has put in my life? Well, to explore this theme, I'd like to invite you, if you would, to turn with me in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Colossians. Colossians. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. That'll be our passage for this morning. If you'd like to use the Pew Bibles in front of you, you'll find that text on page 985. Now, as you're getting there in your Bibles, 
I just want to tell you one reason that I love the book of Colossians is that it's written by, of course, the one and only, the great Apostle Paul, but it's written by the Apostle Paul to a group of very everyday, normal Christians. They're just everyday people living in an ordinary city, carrying out their somewhat ordinary lives. I mean, if you look in your Bible maps, the back of your Bible, you probably won't even find Colossian, uh, Col the city of Colossae even listed there. <laughs> That's how ordinary their city was. And yet these ordinary Christians had an extraordinary mission that they were to live out. Let's read about it. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Paul writes, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you're a cross-cultural missionary. And you're given an assignment to go and reach a tribal people in an isolated village deep in the jungles of some remote nation where the gospel has never been preached. And so that's you. You're this cross-cultural missionary and you, you parachute in to this remote village. Let me ask you, as a missionary, what would you do on day one? if that was you? How would you analyze the various boundaries or barriers between uh, you and the people that prevent you from getting the gospel out to them? I'm sure you'd busy yourself like learning their language, right? Learning their culture, eating their food. How would you strategically organize your life so that you could get into people's lives? How would you strategically participate in certain activities and events and go to certain locations where you would maximize your ability to interact with the people even as you seek to learn what they're like and to communicate the gospel to them? In other words, how would you adopt a missional posture if you were sent as a cross-cultural missionary to a culture like that? All right, put that question aside. Let me ask you another question. Next, imagine that rather than going as a cross-cultural missionary to some remote village, imagine that you went as a cross-cultural missionary and parachuted into your own life. Like you came into your own home, your very neighborhood, your job at Raytheon, your military base where you work, your classroom where you teach, your retirement home where you live, if you were to parachute in, as it were, what would you do on day one as a cross-cultural missionary? How would you think about the people around you and analyze their ways and learn their loves and their idols, perhaps? How would you invest in people around you for the sake of the gospel? What kind of places would you frequent in order to maximize your interactions with people in order to have conversations with them, in order to break through some of those invisible barriers to get the gospel to them. How would you live like a missionary in your own world, in your own life, in your very shoes? See, here's this morning's main idea that I want each of us to understand. As Christians, we must see ourselves as missionaries in our very own daily lives. As Christians, you and I must see ourselves as missionaries in our very own lives. This is precisely the message that Paul wants the Colossians to understand. In particular, Paul tells the Colossians and us that we should pray like missionaries, we should live like missionaries, and we should speak like missionaries. Those three things. Let's take a look at them one by one. First of all, he says we must pray like missionaries in our very own lives. Chapter 4, verse 2. Look there. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving, and at the same time, pray also for us 
that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Now, these verses show us that our very first priority in reaching people with the gospel is prayer. It's prayer. If you think about it, the greatest boundary to people's reception of the gospel is a spiritual boundary. According to the Bible, Satan has actually blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. And so we need God himself to open people's spiritual eyes. And therefore, our first priority should be to pray. Well, maybe you say, how then should we pray? How should we pray? Notice, first Paul says we should pray steadfastly. Verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. That word steadfastly simply means Pray and keep at it. Pray like a marathon runner, not a sprinter. Notice Paul also says that we should pray watchfully. Watchfully. Again, verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it. That word watchful means stay awake, stay alert, especially with a view to Jesus' return. He's coming soon. We only have so much time. So pray watchfully with a sense of urgency. And then you'll note Paul also tells us we should pray thankfully. Pray thankfully. Again, verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. You know, it's important to pray with thanksgiving because when you thank God for what he's already doing in someone's life, it tunes you up so that you notice God more. You notice what God is doing. And therefore, you're able to step into it too. Putting all these terms together, our prayers for the lost should be consistent, urgent, and grateful. Okay, so that's how we should pray, but for what should we pray? What specific requests should we be making as we pray on mission? At this point, Paul invites the Colossians to pray for him and to pray for his missionary colleagues as they spread the gospel. And he implies that the Colossians should pray these types of things for themselves as well. Take a look at it, verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear which is how I ought to to speak. Now, I see two specific prayer requests in these verses. First, Paul says, pray for open doors. Pray for open doors. Verse 3, pray that God may open to us a door for the word. Man, what a great image. What a great image, an open door. Because if you think about it, doors don't open by themselves. Somebody has to push the door open, or maybe your little dog has to nudge it open with his nose, or wind blows a door open, but someone or something has to open a door. Furthermore, doors are a great metaphor for opportunities, right? You step through a door into another room, another opportunity. Putting this all together, Paul is encouraging us to actively pray that God himself would open up opportunities, big and small, that we might step through them with the word of the gospel. Sometimes God opens up a conversational door where you ask a friend a spiritual question and they take the bait and you have a meaningful dialogue with them about gospel things. Or God might open up a situational door where maybe your colleague at work, she's going through a really tough time and because you're there and able to meet that psychological, emotional need, you're also able to share the hope of Christ. Maybe God opens up a geographic door where someone ready to hear the gospel moves right next door to you. Sometimes God can even use painful doors in our lives. God can take difficult and frustrating experiences and transform them into opportunities to speak about his gospel to those who look on. I mean, did you actually notice Paul's life situation as he writes these words to the Colossians? Paul's in prison. Did you notice that? Verse 3. He says, At the same time, pray for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. 
See, Paul is under house arrest. It's very likely what you read about at the very end of the book of Acts, where Paul's made it all the way to Rome. Now he is under house arrest, constantly chained to Roman soldiers on something like four-hour shifts. Can you imagine that? One soldier unlocks, another one comes, one right after another. You're chained to them. How frustrating that would be for most of us because we would see it as bondage. Paul doesn't see it as bondage. He sees it as a door, an open door. Come to think of it, Paul's not chained to those soldiers. From another perspective, those soldiers are chained to the apostle Paul. Can you imagine it? There he is, handcuff on his wrist and on the poor soldier. <laughs> Paul's like, well, we got some time here. <laughs> Tell me about your spiritual life, buddy, you know? And Paul's asking the Colossians, hey, take this painful, frustrating, claustrophobic situation in my life and pray that it will be an open door so that I can get the gospel to more and more of these soldiers that are chained to my wrist. What about you, brothers and sisters? Do you pray for God to open gospel doors through the circumstances in your life, including the painful circumstances? Do you pray for doors at work, doors at home, doors as you go through sickness and pain and people look on? Think right now about the most frustrating scenario that's going on in your life. What if you were to begin praying that that very scenario would be a door to share the message and show the message of Jesus to those around you? Do you regularly pray for doors in other people's lives, other Christians' lives? I recommend that in your community group, as you pray for one another, don't forget to pray for opportunities for doors as you spread out all over this city into your workplaces and into your neighborhoods that you would have doors to step through for the sake of the gospel. So first request here is that Paul prays for doors, but notice also that Paul prays for clarity. He prays for clarity. Look again at verses 3 and 4. He says, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. That I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. By the way, those two young men that gave their testimony being baptized this morning, they made it clear, did they not? Praise God for how they articulated the gospel. And it always astonishes me that the Apostle Paul, the one and only the Apostle Paul, right, the most effective, articulate, spirit-filled missionary the world has ever known, it always boggles my mind that the Apostle Paul would pray that he would be clear when he communicates the gospel. He's asking the Colossians to pray for him that he wouldn't get tongue-tied in those moments, that he wouldn't muddy up the message, that he would be crystal clear and not hidden in any way. Well, that just encourages me because I think if the apostle Paul had to pray that he wouldn't get tongue-tied, that he would be clear, how much more should we pray for one another, brothers and sisters? Does that encourage you? Even Paul needed God's strength and the prayers of God's people to be clear. Well, here's the application for us. Like the Colossians, we must pray like missionaries. And here's what I want to encourage you to do this coming year. Would you take a moment to just think about your life and isolate in your mind's eye two individuals that you regularly interact with in your life who don't know Christ? Maybe jot their names down on your bulletin or just... Make a mental note of them. And what I want to encourage each of us to do this year is pray for those two individuals. Just regularly pray for them for the sake of their, the gospel's impact on their life. Commit to praying for them regularly. Pray for them steadfastly. Pray for them watchfully. Pray for them Thankfully, as we talked about today, pray for God to open up doors of opportunity in their lives that you might actually be able to step through in order to communicate and show the gospel to them. Pray that when you do step through those doors, you will make the message clear. Invite your community group to pray along with you about those names. And here's the thing. Watch what God can do when his people pray. See, we must pray like missionaries. That's the first thing. But it doesn't stop there. Secondly, we must live like missionaries. We must live like missionaries. Look there at verse 5. 
Paul says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Again, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. You know, that word walk is an ancient metaphor for living. It's a metaphor for life. Just as you walk along a path and walk through the ups and downs and twists and turns of a pathway in the same way, you walk along through life with all of its ups and downs, twists and turns. And so Paul is essentially saying that we should live wisely before outsiders. Now, maybe you say, well, who's outsiders? It's not meant to be a pejorative term. Outsiders refers simply to those who are still outside the faith, those who have not yet become Christians. And so what Paul is saying here is that we should order our lives wisely as we live them before unbelievers. Well, maybe you ask, what does that really look like more concretely? Well, Paul clarifies with the next phrase there. He says, making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. That phrase literally means to buy up the time. As though time were a commodity that you could purchase and then use for good purposes. Buy up the time. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. They translate it, make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. Now look, we all know that time is a precious commodity. It really is, isn't it? And we also know that in our modern world, we are all busier than ever before. And I think that one of the greatest boundaries that we face as Christians, the greatest bound, one of the greatest boundaries to the gospel is the boundary of isolation from unbelievers. Our lives become isolated over time. And you can reach a point in your Christian life where basically you look around and realize that you have almost all Christian friends. And you get so busy with so many Christian activities that it squeezes out all of the space left for any relationship with unbelievers. What should we do if that's the case? I've been helped by an excellent book by pastor and author Jonathan Dotson. He says that we need to strategically force ourselves to get out of our Christian ghettos. He writes this. How can we escape our Christian ghettos? For starters, consider swapping out Christian versions of cultural activities. Instead of joining a Christian book club... Join one at your local bookstore. Instead of playing church league sports, join a city league. Instead of inviting just Christian friends over for dinner, invite your neighbors over. Getting out of the ghetto and into the street will give us opportunities to learn what others believe and why they believe it and to enter into thoughtful, respectful dialogue about Christ. I think he gets that about right, doesn't he? Now look, he's not saying that we shouldn't have Christian friends or engage in Christian activities. What he's saying here is that we need to analyze our lives and, and consider whether we might sometimes be a little out of balance. Where if everything that we're doing is among Christians and with Christians and in Christian meal use, well, maybe we need to shift the balance a bit and discover places in our lives where we can regularly go to interact with unbelievers. What Dotson is essentially advocating is the development of habits. Habits that regularly put you in proximity with unbelievers. So perhaps joining a certain club where you can pursue a hobby with unbelievers or making a regular habit of inviting your neighbors over for dinner or habitually visiting certain coffee shops so that you get to know the people there and the baristas there. As you do these things and go to these places on purpose, as a habit, you develop opportunities to have great conversations with people about the ultimate things that matter most. It's living wisely and then making the most of every opportunity. For me this year, you know, I'm planning on coaching soccer for one of my sons and then being an involved Boy Scout dad with my other son. Now, this is going to kill two birds with one stone, I suppose, because on the one hand, I want to invest in my kids. That's my lead reason. But along with it, in engaging in those regular habitual activities, I'm hoping that I can also build relationships with other dads in the community. Those are a few things I'm planning on. What about you? 
brothers and sisters, are there regular habitual activities that you're involved with or spaces where you go where you encounter and converse with people who are far from God? Maybe this is the year where you can think of a creative habit, a creative activity that you can regularly do. And that creative habit will serve as a platform for opportunities. Let me give an example. I think of the time that Elder Andy Griffiths and I uh, were planning to meet up to discuss some church things. And rather than meet in the office, we decided to go to a coffee shop there on Broadway, a coffee shop by the name of Savaya. And uh, so we're sitting there in this coffee shop. We're talking about church stuff. And I'm sharing with him about this, this book that I'm reading, you know, um, a Christian book and theological book. And I'm talking to him about it. And Savaya is one of those coffee shops where the tables are situated way too close together. You know what I'm talking about? And you're like trying to talk to somebody and you, could, you just so, feel so insecure because you feel like everybody can listen in. Well, little did we know that there was this guy sitting next to us. We'll just call him Joe. And Joe was actually an outgoing, inquisitive, intellectual atheist. He hears me talking about this book, and he just kind of butts in. He's like, well, that sounds like an interesting book. What's it all about? And I'm thinking to myself, man, this, this coffee shop has the tables way too close together, you know? <laughs> um, and we turn to this charming man and just begin a conversation with him. I tell him, well, this, you know, this is a book about the sovereignty of God that I'm, I'm reading. And, you know, we kind of chit-chat and go back and forth and learn a little bit about him. And I'm thinking to myself, how can I make the most of this opportunity right here? And the Holy Spirit was kind of just laying on my heart. Well, just give him the book. And I'm thinking to myself, but I haven't even finished reading it myself. <laughs> like, I just bought it on Amazon like two days ago. Really? Just give him the book. I'm like, okay, so I just turn to him and say, you know, this book's interesting. Why don't you just have my copy? Uh, if you read it, great. If you don't, just leave it on your shelf. That's all right. But if you do read it uh, and work through it, maybe jot down some questions and shoot me an email. Here's my email address and, and let me know and maybe we can meet up later and discuss it. We walk out of the coffee shop. I think nothing of it. And like a week later, I get an email from this guy. He's a, he's a quick reader, you know. He's like, well, I read the book. Not very compelling, but let's get together and talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm back at the same coffee shop engaging with Joe, having a very robust discussion. Now, I wish the story ended in, you know, some glorious conversion. It didn't. But it did lead to a great conversation where at least he was able to see what a loving, sophisticated conversation between an atheist and a Christian can look like and feel like. And I have no idea what other Christians the Lord might bring into his life. But as I reflect on the experience, there were two things that happened that led to this ability to have these conversations. One is our environment, right? Our habit of going into this coffee shop where the tables are a little too close together. Rather than having our meeting behind closed doors here at the church, we were having our meeting out in the public square, as it were. And that led to opportunities. The second thing that, was, that happened was the Holy Spirit opened up one of those doors, prompted me to seize the opportunity, and in this case, I was able to step in and obey. Now look, that's just one example from my life. I'm sure you guys can come up with plenty of other stories, much better than mine. As you've been out in the world, living wisely among those who don't know Christ yet, and as you're seizing and redeeming those opportunities to share. Because here's the point. We all must live like missionaries. Pray like missionaries, yes. And then live like missionaries. But finally, there's a third thing. We must also speak like missionaries. We must speak like missionaries. Missionaries in our very own lives. Look at verse 6. I love this verse. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Wow, notice the emphasis on words here. Speech, right? Though living on mission involves good deeds and loving your neighbor and being hospitable and so forth, our ultimate aim is to share with words the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We want to share this message. Well, maybe you ask, what is this gospel message that we must share? 
Well, the gospel message is this. The gospel is the good news that though we have all sinned and rebelled against our good and holy creator God, and though we deserve God's wrath and his judgment, God himself has made a way for us to be put right with him again. God has sent his son Jesus to defeat sin and death and evil through his perfect life, his death on the cross for sinners, and his bodily resurrection. And all of those who trust in this Jesus can be forgiven and made new and set right in a loving relationship with God both now and forever. This is good news indeed. This is the message that we proclaim to people. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes we get to share the entire message with someone. I love it when that happens. You just get to spend time articulating the full thing. Sometimes, maybe you're journeying in a Bible study with an unbeliever, reading the Bible together with them, and as you go over various paragraphs of Scripture, you get to talk about the gospel thoroughly and all of its dynamics. But other times, you only have opportunity to share maybe one small facet of the gospel, one key concept related to the gospel, one central idea. And still there are other times when all you have time to do is ask someone an important question that might stir their heart up in a gospel direction. Don't put pressure on yourself to have to give people a four-point outline every time you try to share. You're going to sound like a salesman. Sharing the gospel can be about relating to people, asking interesting questions, finding your opening, and speaking to this or that point of this larger gospel message. And sometimes God will give you opportunity to share the whole thing. In fact, here we see that Paul says our speech, as we're sharing, should have certain characteristics. First, our speech should be gracious. Did you notice that? Verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious. In other words, we shouldn't sound like a salesman trying to close the deal. We shouldn't be pushy or harsh or antagonistic. We should be kind, inquisitive, conversational, thoughtful, engaging, and relational. We should be gracious. Notice as well that our speech should be salty. Again, verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Your speech should be salty. I got to tell you, I love me some salt. It just makes every meal taste better, doesn't it? I think I told you before, one time Abby put me on this horrible diet where we were supposed to be doing this cleanse. We basically ate like vegans for six straight weeks. Among a norm number of horrible things about that diet, we weren't allowed to have any salt. And so like halfway through it, I'm like, I can't take it anymore. And I just like, I just like cheated and I had all this salt. And I'm just like dumping the salt on all the food. And I got to tell you, even a vegan meal tastes really good when you finally get some salt on it. It just brings out the flavor, right? Well, brothers and sisters, our speech, especially when we're sharing the gospel, should be salty. It should be winsome and compelling and good-natured and interesting and flavorful. Don't oversalt, you know. Just the right amount. In fact, you want to know one of the best ways to salt your conversations, to put salt in them? It's simply this. Ask people questions. Develop the fine art of asking questions. Be curious about people's lives and just pepper them with questions and really listen to their answers. You know, Francis Schaeffer was once asked what he would do if he were given one hour to speak with an unbeliever about the Lord. He said he would spend 55 minutes listening to them. And then in the last five minutes, he would have something to say. I think that's just about right. Because look, our culture is starved for attention. Most people never get to ask, most people never have anybody ask them about their lives. They just get talked at all day long. So what happens when Christians begin to add salt to their conversations with eager questions that dig deeper into people's lives? Let me just challenge you with this suggestion, even this week. What if you and I were to ask a colleague or a neighbor or a friend this simple question as you interact with them? Just ask them this. So, so-and-so, I've enjoyed getting to know you, but let me ask you this. Where are you on your spiritual journey? Simple question, right? Where are you on your spiritual journey? It's non-threatening. 
I guarantee you that if you ask someone that kind of a question, they'll probably talk your ear off. And when they answer the question, I would encourage you, listen well and then ask a follow-up question. And then listen some more and then ask another follow-up question and another and another and another. And you know what will eventually happen? As they share their heart, their life, their beliefs with you, eventually they'll turn that conversation over and perhaps you ask you about your faith and you'll have opportunity to share about the hope of Christ in you. See, our speech should be gracious. Our speech should be salty. But notice finally, our speech should also be prepared. Look there at verse 6. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Answer each person. With this final phrase, Paul has in view, I think, those moments when people have objections to Christianity, when people pose questions about Christianity. Most of us, I think, dread the idea that somebody might actually ask a question that we can't answer. And so we shy away from talking with people about our faith. I think for most of us, our personal fear of challenging questions becomes a boundary, another one of those boundaries, that keeps us from sharing our faith. If that's you, you're not alone. And let me see if I can encourage you. Because I think that the best way that you can prepare to answer people's questions about Christianity is to let them stump you. <laughs> the best way to prepare for answering people's questions about Christianity is just to get in there and start having conversations with people and wait to be stumped. Like, wait for somebody to actually ask you a question that you really don't know the answer to. And it's in that moment that you're literally going to have to say to them, well, now that's a really good question. I'm really not sure how to answer that. i got to think that through. Can I think it through? Maybe we could talk about it some more later. And when someone asks you a question that stumps you, here's what happened. You have this emotional memory now of that question. And if you actually go home and do some research and figure out how you might answer it in a gospel way, you'll never forget that question and you'll never forget the way to answer it. And next time, you'll be ready to go. we got to start thinking of our failures as an advantage in being prepared. Now, there's other ways to prepare yourself for questions people ask. For instance, you can pick up Jonathan Dotson's excellent book, The Unbelievable Gospel. He's the guy I quoted earlier in the sermon. I like this book because it really deals with how to share the gospel with people in our particular, particular cultural milieu, a postmodern environment where people are skeptical of truth claims and so on, an environment very relationally oriented. Well, Dotson gives some great and helpful suggestions. If you'd like to come after, up after the message, I can give you the title. You can leaf through the book. Or you could read things by great apologists like Tim Keller, Ravi Zacharias, William Lane Craig, or perhaps John Lennox. You can watch pretty much all of these guys on YouTube and literally observe how they interact with unbelievers and handle various objections. You can also take one of our equipping classes here at Christ Community Church. Keep an eye on the schedule because uh, on a regular basis, we tend to come out with different equipping classes that deal with apologetics. Now look, here's one thing that I do to prepare to have an answer for people's questions. I often have a debate with myself. Seriously, I look like a crazy person when I do. But I think through in my mind's eye, like, what's the sort of question that a skeptic might ask? And then I interact with me trying to answer that very question. So if you see me driving around through Tucson, like, talking out loud, all emotional and stuff, I'm probably having a debate with me, right? I'm probably defending the faith against me. I'm not mad. I'm just trying to be a better apologist. I recommend it. The point is this. Do your best to be prepared for people's objections because not only must we pray like missionaries and live like missionaries, but we must speak like missionaries too. Now look, I want to conclude this message with a public confession. Got everybody's attention now? I'm not very good at this. I'm not very good at living on mission. 
I mean, I forget to pray for the lost all the time. I overclutter my life with busyness, squeezing out time that I would have been able to spend with people far from Christ. I often cave in to fears when I should boldly articulate my faith. I'm not very good at living on mission, but here's the good news. I don't have to do this alone, and neither do you. See, brothers and sisters, we get to live on mission together. Do you realize that this passage in Colossians is written not just to individuals, but it's written to a whole church. It's written to a community. And this means that we should be praying together for the lost. We should be organizing our lives together in a wise way in our culture. We can speak together about this beautiful word of the gospel. We can hold each other accountable. We can encourage one another. We can fuel each other on in this great missional endeavor. We can live live on mission as individual Christians, yes, but we do it in the company of the saints. So this year, Christ Community Church, let's grow in this topic together. Let's grow in what it means to live on mission together. Let's learn to live as missionaries in our very own lives.